Yo, what's good, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Gifted Hoops podcast. It's been a while, but we're back today. We're uploading. Um, I feel a bit bad about this podcast because 30 minutes of data got deleted. So you're not going to be able to hear the full conversation I had with Camille. Shout out to Camille Monet. She's the host of Locked On Bucks. She does great work for them. Also, she has a podcast called Technical Foul. But in today's episode, we'll be discussing the Milwaukee Bucks and the ins and outs of their offseason, the turbulence that they had last year, and specifically how much more competitive they can be. Now, in the footage that got deleted, sadly, we really got into the nitty-gritty of the season. I'll just leave these footnotes here. Essentially, we focused on what happened to the Bucks during the regular season, why moving off of Adrian Griffin was important for the Bucks, since he didn't really serve great value as a head coach, in my opinion. Also, she kind of believed that. And sometimes the things just aren't working. You have to move on and just strip things from the root of where they are. So we really addressed that in depth. But again, the file got corrupted. So this episode has a bit of issues with that. Um, moving forward, things should be a lot better. But on top of that, we also spoke about Giannis and Dame year one and the pressure that they had on them where Dame had a down year by his standards but still was able to impact the game at a high level the impact of having to move certain pieces to make this roster fit and also the additions to the Bucks, right like what you can see from Gary Trent as a movement shooter unlocked in their new offense and also the truth about Doc Rivers a lot of this stuff got cut and I'm sad about that but it kind of is what it is so I'm going to give you a Spartanos version essentially Doc Rivers being on the Milwaukee Bucks and how he had to basically take over a team for the second half of the season and how maybe with a full offseason and a training camp can really implement his system and make players better. But more importantly, addressing his flaws as a coach with also having problems adjusting. He's still a better coach than Adrian Griffin. And we're speaking about making the younger players better and making them fit better in ways that will help you because players like Andre Jackson, like these are the types of guys that really need to get more burn and more minutes to impact winning because of what he can do defensively. So all in all, I feel sick and I am kind of sick right now as you're hearing this, but a lot of this podcast got really erased and we had such a great, great conversation. Um, Hopefully I'll, I'll be able to have Camille on in the future during the season to recap talking about her team but essentially she believes that the milwaukee bucks can be a team that wins a title that wins a championship and i don't think that's too far from the reality of the milwaukee bucks i think there's more work that has to be done as a roster for them to be able to reach that mountaintop but year two of Giannis and dame is loading and if actually speaking dame was not in the best of shape coming into the season because he wasn't prepared to be traded and he didn't want to injure himself before being traded. Dame came out in, you know, different interviews and talked about his conditioning level just simply was not the same. And having a full offseason to jail and make things work with the new Bucks roster and Giannis is going to be a big part of judging their productivity together. Also, in terms of the Damian Lillard trade and Drew Holiday trade, Camille said it felt bittersweet, but she felt like she needed to have that trade done for the Bucks, because at the end of the day as good as Drew Holiday was this roster had a clear ceiling with how things are going with Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday as their next second best offensive players so making the Dame trade wasn't a problem but the moves after the Dame trade is something that she criticized but unfortunately you know because I had problems with my computer where literally every file got deleted we had to move on from that conversation but I've talked a lot um, this podcast episode isn't going to be as long as the other ones due to the data stuff. And I don't want to fill in the gaps too crazy. But we had a pretty good conversation still about the Bucks in the 2025 Eastern Conference. In the comments, let me know what you think of the Milwaukee Bucks. Do you believe they are a team that deserves criticism for last season? Do you look at them as a legitimate title contender? Let me know about that in the comments. But without further ado... We're going to get into this episode about the Milwaukee Bucks. Shout out to Camille again. Go follow all of her socials. If you're looking for this podcast, you can find it on Apple Podcasts and Spotify at Gifted Hoops. This episode, again, is detailing the Milwaukee Bucks in their totality ahead of the 2025 season. Appreciate all the support. 
let's get right into it it's gonna pick up very fast because again i lost a huge chunk of data but it's gonna start with camille talking about the bucks and why she's high on them to be a real winner this upcoming season peace out i'm really high on the bucks this particular upcoming season i feel like all of the guys who they brought in in free agency um are improvements on the guys that they're replacing so like yes. DeLon Wright is a better version of Pat Bev. He's younger. He does a little bit more than what Pat Bev can do. Torian Prince is the Jay Crowder replacement, a move that didn't work out for the Bucks. Five second round. I I will never forget the timeline. See, he got traded for five uh, seconds <laughs> and it was DNP. Yeah. And yep. I, I got it. I understood why, because they saw like, okay, he's somebody who could unlock some lineups. If he is who we right. think he is, he can play small ball four. We can do some creative things. It just didn't work out. But I think Torian Prince is a guy, again, a better version of what they were hoping to get from Jay Crowder with the three-point shooting and the defense. Just don't play him like 30-some minutes. I learned from all my Laker fan friends. We don't want him playing. Yeah, just don't go past that little bridge. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, mm -hmm. We don't want that. And then you have Gary Trent Jr. coming in, somebody who was a shocker to get at the He back. was a steal to me. Steal. Absolute steal, steal for the Bucs. Huge yeah. deal. And that's like a Malik Beasley upgrade in a sense as well. So it, it's one of those things where like the pieces make a, a bit more sense together. And you're counting on second year. Really, it's like Doc had an audit year kind of before he came in having a half a season. Now you get yeah. a full off season and you get to really incorporate things. So like I have I have a lot of optimism about the Bucks going into this season. Yeah, I feel like for me, I've almost taken a complete 180 because after the Dame trade, I said, listen, I like the Bucks team. But their defense, to me, is not legitimate to be a real contender. I don't know what this head coach is going to do. I think the first year of Dame and Giannis, there's going to be some growing pains because I didn't think that Giannis was going to be um, a great screener year one because he's never had to consistently play that role all the time. And I feel like there was going to be a growing pain process. I'm like, okay, I'll put you on hold for now, but year two – I want to see what you do. And I feel like all the pieces you named are just more better fits. And also, Gary Trent is a guy I really want to focus on. You can let me know if I'm gassing it. But I really feel like getting Gary Trent to me, he felt like the final piece made me feel like, oh, yeah, they're in that conversation. Because Gary Trent is a guy that at his best in Portland with Dame, which is, you know, a huge reason why he signed. He was a good defensive player. He showed good value on the defensive side of the ball. I think ever since then, it's been very inconsistent. But I think back with Dame on a team that's actually trying to win and compete at a high level, you're getting a high-level shooter who's not 6'1", six, 6'0", six like, like a Malik Beasley, who's not like absolute barbecue food on defense like Beasley was. I'm sorry. I just have to, you know. Oh, <laughs> hey, it is what it is. Yeah. He tried. Yeah. Yes, he tried. Right. I'm just saying having Gary Trent as a hypothetical POA guy more than that, which really it'll be more so DeLon, right? But mm -hmm. still, I like that fit a lot more in the shooting. Anytime you can put high-level shooters next to <laughs> Giannis and also having Dame as a guy is great because now maybe you can have more plays where, okay, Giannis inverted pick and roll. You're the bar handler. Dame you set a screen trent you move off the ball guys you set off ball screens right to to really get the offense going and having more juice i just like the positional versatility the bucks have this year compared to last year a lot more same same it all makes a lot more sense for this team and again listen the way that dame came to milwaukee before training camp started he mentioned all last offseason he didn't really work out because he was scared to get hurt before he got traded yes so he yeah. spent a lot of last year trying to find himself and he admitted like there's two seasons in his career where he knew he wasn't right he, and last year with the bucks was one of those two years where he knew like i'm just not right i'm trying to figure all of this out in addition to getting used to the new team the, the trade a new city he had a lot of things going on in his personal life off the court uh, with the divorce situation happening, not seeing his kids, so on and so forth. All that. So like, there was a lot of things going on for him, and he feels just so much more mentally ready for this upcoming season. And honestly, Dame is a big piece of what this Bucks team is going to be able to do because Dame had a bad year last year, and I think he averaged like 26 points and seven assists still, where it's like, yeah, this was a bad damn year and he gave us 26 and 7. And it's like we still, need more. Yeah. yeah, it's like there's more to that uh with him still. So, yeah, I'm I'm excited about it and I do think this team makes a lot more sense now. 
Yeah, I, I think that the Eastern Conference is such an interesting conference because you got so many teams at the top who have loaded up and gotten better that I feel like the Bucks are getting lost in that conversation because a lot of people are so focused on how they look last year with the losses and like the injuries. I feel like the biggest X factor for this Bucks team kind of has to be Chris Middleton at this point. And I want to give Chris his flowers because he had a weird season where for half of it, he was healthy. Mm -hmm. He left a lot to be desired in spots. But then in the playoffs, he had very big games where it's like, no, this isn't the dang game. This is the Chris Middleton game where he's on fire and can't miss from three, right? He's showing you that he can still get to that. The, the two ankle surgeries concern me a little bit, but I like that he got it early, so he'll be ready for training camp, which is the biggest thing. I think if Chris Middleton is able to go on both ends, it raises the floor for this roster way more. Now, I'm going to be completely honest with you because you've been honest this entire show. Thank you. Okay. Chris Middleton is my favorite Bucks player. Chris Middleton is one of Ooh, my favorite okay. players, just period. I love the game. I love I love mid-range players, first and foremost. Word. Okay. Uh, and Chris Middleton goes to work in the mid-range. So I have to say that first and foremost. Chris is my boy. Um, right. So, yeah, I definitely do think that he is an important factor for this team. Because as you mentioned, like he just had a weird year and he's had a few since the championship run where it's just been unfortunate yeah. injuries for him over and over. So to see his performance in the playoffs where, again, the ankles were giving him trouble during that particular series as well. And then he re-aggravated one of his ankles during the Pacer series and was mm -hmm. still doing what he was doing on the court. I think the importance of Chris Middleton isn't just when Damian Yance is on the floor but also when those two are sitting and he gets to run the, uh, the staggers. Yes, yes absolutely. The staggering is very important. That's part of Chris Middleton's like allure for this Milwaukee Bucks team. Not only does he have the scoring, but I don't think people realize how much playmaking he brings to the team as well. He organizes guys. He's telling people where to go. The IQ is there for him. And defensively, he does not move the way that he used to. The lateral quickness has been zapped. Sadly. Yeah. yeah. Sadly so. Sure. But again, it's part of him getting older. He's had the injuries. But the thing with Chris is that he's so intelligent. He's still a good team defender. You just don't want him in situations where he's going to have to check whoever the best guy is on the opposing no. side. But yeah, he's definitely a key for this Milwaukee Bucks team. Not only when Damon Giannis are on the court and their gravity is creating for him, but when he's able to create for others while he's the only guy on the, on the floor from that big three as well. I mean, that's what makes it so interesting because – I think this 2020, I think this 2025 roster in terms of, of staggering, you have shooting off of your bench. You have guys who can rebound. You have guys who can do a bit more athletically than you did last year. And I just think that makes such a big difference. Again, Gary Trent as a spark plug option who can shoot. He averaged like nearly 17 points last year. He is a scoring type of guard. So even if Dame and Giannis are not on the floor, you can see him fitting in well to those bench overall units where he can score against the second units for other teams. And I think that that just adds to your potent potentness in terms of attack because depth matters in the NBA. Continuity matters in the NBA. If you don't have those two things more times than not, you're not going to be able to win at the highest level. That's a fact. That's a fact. And the thing, too, with Gary Trent Jr. that I'm really looking forward to seeing is just the role that he plays. So you mentioned mm. when he's on the court with Dame and with Giannis, he's going to understand. And a lot of guys say this who play with Giannis for the first time, but they're always like, I've never had this many open shots in my life. Um, and yeah. that's part of the, the gravity created by a Giannis. And when you pair Dame in there with that as well, that's what Malik Beasley mentioned. Like, yo, I'm getting some really open looks. I just got to be ready to catch and shoot and let's go so Trent is going to definitely be in that role and then also if he's sharing that backcourt with Dame as we mentioned he's going to have a bigger defensive workload as well and I think over the last few years and some really awkward situations in his last awkward for stuff, sure yeah awkward fits for him like he's had to put a big scoring load on his back so again you know he can do it um, but I do want to see how if his role is paired back offensively while he's sharing the court with those guys how much of that defense uptick and also to your point, when he's able to run those bench units, and it's like, okay, hey, now you can run the show a little bit more. Go ahead and get into your bag. Go ahead and get some buckets. Um, just how that works out for him. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that as well. I really love all three offseason edition for the Bucks this year. Yeah. Like, 
Thwan Wright, the defense coming in, Torian Prince, the defense, the shooting, like, and they're all younger than some of the guys they were replacing as well. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. Like that, that, that is another big thing because I kept saying, like, I'm nervous about this Bucks roster because Dame trade aside, everyone around Giannis is aging yep. and no one really says this, but Giannis is what's saving this team athletically. There's not that many above the rim guys really on this roster, not named Giannis. So they're going to need to find younger guys who can do things. Um, I want to point this out. This might be hate. Okay. okay, okay. This whole podcast, you've been honest. I'm going to be so real with you. If I was in charge of the Bucks, I would rather employ Lonnie Walker than Pat Connaughton. That's just me. <laughs> the defense, the burst, like I think Lonnie Walker could be a really good fit on this Bucks team. I do. He was somebody over the offseason where that was a name on the list. Like, let's keep okay. an eye on, on Lonnie Walker because he could have been a, a good fit. Now, the Pat Connaughton thing is interesting. He is somebody that Bucks fans are low on as well. So you're not alone in saying okay. like Bucks fans have been wanting for a Pat Connaughton trade to happen. And over the offseason. Off season was like maybe maybe that's on the table maybe it's in the cards but one thing that doc Rivers said when he became the head coach is that he was spending time with pat connaughton and trying to build up his confidence because he mm, believed okay. in pat connaughton uh what pat connaughton brings to the table athleticism is leaving him a little bit the three-point shooting is the three-point shooting and just being in the right places and doing the right things so like I'm not exactly sure what this upcoming season is going to have in store for Pat Connaughton. He's going to get opportunity for sure. Um, but I am curious to see if some of those young guys just don't outright beat him uh, for minutes on this team going forward. Yeah. And I don't mean to like hate on him as if he's never like, listen, Pat Connaughton, I have this etched in my brain forever, right? Because again, the 22-1 playoffs is... A playoff run that I watch quite often, like maybe twice a year, right? What I have forever have etched in my brain, the net series, which to me is one of the best series in some time now, right? The amount of possessions where Brooklyn is playing great half court defense, contrary to popular belief, they're playing great half court defense, but the amount of rebounds Drew Holiday and Pat Connaughton would just get in and grab to extend yep. possessions. To me, those are winning players. So I do think that Pat Connaughton is that, but I think the hardest part in the NBA is you get attachments to these players in these roles for sure, but ultimately to win, you got to also focus on keeping up with the future, keeping up with all the other teams that are getting better. And I just feel like for Pat Connaughton, I'm a bit lower on his able, sorry, his ability to get back into that great role he played four to five years ago. I'm hoping he can, but I like the aspect of just having younger guys who are just more physical and can score the ball more. I think Lonnie Walker in, in all angles fits that I'm very surprised. He's not signed yet as a Warriors fan. I would be interested, but we literally have 13 point guards on the roster. So I, I can't really entertain that as much, but yeah, I just think that that's the next interesting thing for the bucks to see how these guys age, which kind of brings me to what your expectations are, because even if the bucks look better, and things fit better if they don't win a title this year how much pressure does that put on the front office in terms of shaping up this roster i don't think it's title or bust in milwaukee uh in that mm. sense but okay. i will say this because the bucks have been out in the playoffs in the first round two years running now if the bucks i don't think make it at least to that second round it depends on how you lose always as well but like right i feel like conference finals is like the goal for the team at the very least i have confidence in this team if they're healthy and i, I mean of course everybody says health is so important especially of for course. this bucks team when you've seen how injuries have derailed in the last two seasons in particular well honestly the last three since they won the championship uh, like it's important for them. And that's what it takes to win a championship. You need, you need a little luck. And that luck normally comes in with that health. Like, can we be healthy at the right time? You gotta be playing good ball, be healthy and have yep. a little bit of luck. Um, so like if they can be healthy, I really think that this is a, a finals contending team. Like I think the bucks can win the NBA finals this year, but okay. when it comes to how much pressure is on the front office, if they have another first round exit, I think you see a Ooh. drastic roster overturn at that okay. point. Uh, they get past the first round. How they if they lost in the second round depends on how. But they get to the conference finals. I think everybody's just kind of okay. We got close. We need to retool some things and then and then go back at it again. But um, yeah, I think there's 
the seat's a little warm in Milwaukee, but I don't think it's as hot as some people might think, unless it's another first round exit for the team. Okay. That that is an interesting perspective that I haven't heard. Um, I'll say for me, I think the reason why the seat is very hot is because of the age of Chris Middleton and, and his injury histories. I feel like if you're not able to accomplish that this season, I think moving forward with him as an asset on this team could be a bit strenuous and you might have to trade him while his value is the highest. It's an uncomfortable position and conversation to have for sure, but I really feel like the injuries with his age kind of make it less, hmm, less, less sustainable in terms of his peaks, right? And... I'm not sure what his value is either. I think this could be a breakout year for Dame. I think this is a revenge year for Dame, right? But in terms of how Chris Middleton fits into the into this entire equation, they're going to need him to reach the highest level. But also, with his contract and his age, I wouldn't be surprised if he's the odd man out if they do fail. Honestly, his contract's not even that bad, to be completely yeah. honest with you. And this, this, this season upcoming, then he has a player option. The, the following right. year so like it's it's coming close to the end of it as it is and i mean the the deal is not that bad for chris middleton especially what you're looking for him to do and especially with the fact that the cap keeps going up 10 percent each uh future year as we continue every year to go on. Yep. so like i don't honestly think chris has a bad contract i don't think it'd be hard to move chris's contract what i do think would be difficult for the bucks is to get a player back that can give you a lot of things that chris middleton gives you that make over Chris Middleton, right? Yeah, like that's one thing with Chris Middleton, where it's like he's just a really perfect fit next to Giannis and what they do. And if Dame does have a season, I think that he will have like this really good year of coming back, trying to prove everybody wrong type of year. Um, it frees up Chris because I think a lot of Bucks fans who have had problems with Chris Middleton have had those problems because they felt he was being asked to do too much. But yes. now when you have him in this system here where it's Dame and it's Giannis, and then it's Chris it all fits a little bit more cleanly where his role isn't it's not too much not too much not being asked of him in this particular role so like chris is somebody who again if they flame out in the first round i think everything is on the table for the milwaukee bucks because it has to be at that point you can't lose in the first round three years in a row like thank god Giannis signed his extension last year that was big that was, it big. was huge but yet yeah. still like we know Giannis's mentality Giannis, like i want to compete for championships and i will be here as long as i feel like we can do that so again they got to make some moves this year they cannot they cannot go out in the first round again and not just because i make bucks content and i need to talk about something <laughs> longer <but> right <laughs> for the franchise as well yeah no I think those things are very spot on um i wanted to circle back by the way to something you mentioned earlier which is very very in intriguing right the minutes with Giannis at the five do you think with this roster this year the Bucks are more equipped to have more minutes where you maybe give Brooke Lopez more of a rest where Giannis is the full-time five this year do you think they're equipped well enough to be able to do that I think they can do it in a bit more spurts that's something that Doc okay. wanted to do a little bit more last year but all the injuries that started to come into place started kind of making that difficult for him to to pull that trigger um, so the thing with Giannis is that the year after the Bucks won the championship, Brooke Lopez had the back injury and he missed right. most of that season. And Giannis was forced to play a lot more minutes at the five. And Giannis himself said, like, I don't enjoy this. Like, I don't like playing the five that much. It's a lot of banging on my body. I miss Brooke Lopez. I need him back. Um, so it's one of those things where I do not think Giannis at the five will ever be like, a, at least not this upcoming season. Maybe if he gets older and he puts more weight on, then he's yeah. more equipped for it. But at this stage, I do think that Giannis at the five is still more of like a change of pace thing. Like when the Warriors are like their death lineup and everybody's like, oh, they're going death lineup time, y'all. Like that's how Giannis at the five for the Bucks could be, I think. Yeah, yeah, I would 100% agree with that. I, ju I just I just find it so interesting because if I'm the Bucks owner, I'm really thinking about, okay, who is the future replacement for Brooke Lopez, who is aging so much? Because he plays such a vital role for sure, but it feels like, like a shame because if he gets hurt and something happens, it's like, damn, who else do we have to mimic the value he can give us? I don't even know who I would begin eyeing as another viable big man option if you're the Bucks. shoot when he got hurt the year after the championship that's when we saw like boogie cousins rotate in that's when yeah. we saw them make the sergi baka trade trading out dante divincenzo to get him they tried 
they were trying to find ways to to help fill that gap but like you mentioned it's it's a really hard role to fill if brooke lopez goes down so with the bucks they've generally had a very small big rotation as it is it's Giannis, it's brooke and it's bobby and those are the three bigs right. that, they, that they really utilize so like if brooke went down you're going to be asking a lot from bobby portis and bobby's skill set and his strengths are not the same strengths as brooke lopez so it's one of those things where you have to then try to scheme around that and how do you go about that because even when bobby and Giannis share the court Bobby's generally the five in those situations so that you can keep Giannis in more of that help defense role uh, exactly that he yep. on defense so yeah that's the thing for the Bucks again they need help to go their way because if they have some injury unfortunate injury luck it's it's tough sledding for them yeah and I think the one thing that I'm very excited for as well and this has been a constant thing in Giannis's overall career people un like unfairly to me uh think that he doesn't want to guard the best players on another team and I've always said well it's more about what you do best for your team defensively more than what people might want you to do however in terms of a way to keep Brooke Lopez in the paint maybe allowing Giannis to blitz more in those overall situations might be something Doc Rivers leans on because Bud didn't really want to do that as much I think Doc Rivers might be more flexible to allowing that to happen. And I've seen Giannis improve in those aspects as a defender. Beforehand, maybe three to four years ago, I wouldn't have really wanted him to blitz yeah. out as much. But I think he's really reaching that point where it's a viable thing for him now, I feel like. You saw Doc utilize Bobby Portis that way a lot last year where he was having Bobby Blitz as well. And during the Olympics, which you can't take a lot from the Olympics. I know exactly what you're talking about. Happened, yep. So on and so forth. But you did see Giannis blitzing ball handlers in the Olympics a lot. And it made me think like, is this something that we're going to start seeing the Bucks utilize with him a little bit more? Because to your point about, you know, people complaining about him not holding the best player, so on and so forth. He does what the coach tells him to do. And if coach exactly. is saying like you're going to be in this position, that's what he's going to be in. But we've seen Giannis in situations where he is put on one of the best defenders, and it's like okay, he's doing his job. During the uh, the 21 run to the finals against the Miami Heat, he was the primary defender on Jimmy Butler. On Jimmy Butler in 21, yeah. and he did a very good job on it. I mean, when they played the Suns this past year, whenever Giannis was on KD. KD was it was it was not happening for Kevin Durant. Uh, so it's one of those things too where it's like yes, Giannis in spurts as an on-ball defender, he can cause some havoc. The thing with Giannis is that he's seven feet tall. He's not good if you put him through screens. He gets caught up in those a lot, um, and it can be a little bit difficult for him. But I think that Doc is going to try to utilize him in some more creative ways as well because Giannis likes to play defense. He wants to yeah. cause havoc. I mean, he's he does. coachable. He's going to do what coach tells him to do. So I think it's on the table for him for sure. Yeah. There are so many questions with this team that I can't wait to like fully realize themselves. I kind of want to like preview the 2025 Eastern Conference to really see where the Bucks fit in that overall pecking order because you saw a lot of fluctuations. I never thought in my life that a team would trick me and I would take the bait. The fact that the Nets told everyone for the entire season, <laughs> basically, we you know we want to build a team around Mikael Bridges. I'm like, this, this, this is some of the stupidest like <laughs> thought, thought process I've seen. Like, there's no way they believe he's a franchise player, but then their moves was backing up that premise, mm -hmm. and they were able to pull the wool over everyone's eyes and then traded Mikael to the Knicks for seven first round picks, essentially reset their franchise. They can lose now and still get high value back. And then for the Knicks, you now have OG Ananobi with Mikael Bridges. You now move Dante DiVincenzo and Josh Hart to the bench. And now you have Julius Randle coming back. It's such an interesting team. And I think they're going to win a lot of regular season games. You have a team like the Sixers who signed Paul George, who just got another guy who, you know, to his credit, was cooking up an overseas play in the Olympics. Yabuselli looked like an NBA player to me. He really did, right? And then seeing how Paul George fits into the MVP Joel Embiid two-man game with Tyrese Maxey and their new head coach in Nick Nurse, who was also new to his job as well, just seeing how that works out. So I think the top of the Eastern Conference is extremely strong. And then in the middle, you have teams coming up. 
the, yeah. the Orlando Magic are a very serious team to me. They might have the best defense in the league potentially, right? So right. for you, how are you evaluating the Eastern Conference for the Bucks this year? So I look at it where I put Boston by themselves. Defending champs, y'all get my respect. Y'all Word. are okay. team of the crop, especially after how they ran through the East last year. So Boston defending champs, they're in their own tier. I think that okay. next tier includes the Bucks, the 76ers, and the Knicks as like those big contending teams where it's like I can see it because the Paul George edition in Philly, uh, that was on a hope and a prayer where they had all this cap space and they were like, we hope we can get this free agent to, to pan out here. <laughs> yeah, uh, exactly. If the Golden State Pray. trade would have happened, Philly would have been screwed. <laughs> like, but I really, I, I really was praying. <laughs> as you said, you're a Warriors fan. I bet. Yeah, so it's yeah. One of those things for Philly, where it's like, well, they just upgraded their big three because going from Paul or Tobias Harris to Paul George, awful to upgrade. <laughs> to upgrade. Yeah. And that's one thing I always say. People be talking about Chris Middleton crazy. And I'm like, y'all acting like he's Tobias Harris. He show up in the playoff at least. <laughs> 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 Great point. Great point. I got them in that tier right there. I respect New York. I respect ba- or I respect Philly. And I think Milwaukee's in there with them. And then that next tier is where it gets really interesting, where you have your Orlando, you have Cleveland, uh, you have Indiana. You have these teams that aren't going away easy. Like people might not look at them and think much of them, but like those teams are going to be some real comp and they're going to make the whole right. Eastern Conference standings race complicated. So like, what was that seven teams? I think I said seven, seven, eight teams right there. Like those are yeah. the teams in the East where it's really like, I'm really looking to see what y'all. And then of course you can't count out Miami. Miami's just weird. Like they're always. They're the around. biggest sleeper team in the East because they never make like the big flashy moves, yep. but you look up and it's like, they're competing in the playoffs despite all of that. Well, also injuries. <laughs> yeah. And then also the biggest thing for them, by the way, Jimmy Butler being in a contract year, how serious he will take this season like there's a lot of things that could also wind up well for them so the east is a a dog fight to me yeah it is it's it's not as competitive as the west but it's also not the eastern conference that lebron was running through and people were oh it's it's the least conference like they're right the nba is in a really good spot right now just overall like just the amount of talent in the league like it's a really fun time to be a basketball fan and i've been trying to convince some of the old heads i know who Oh, it ain't the '90s. They're the best era of basketball, and this. And I'm like, man, y'all need to turn the TV on and watch what's going on in the league right now because it is yeah. some talent. It's some talent. Almost every team has a key offensive initiator. Defense is harder to play because it's more offensively skewed, which actually makes defense more important because it's hard to stop these super high-powered offenses. And then even if you focus on teams that people would call bottom feeders in the east i think the hornets are going to surprise a lot of people new head coach who who has like a yeah bro i think charles lee might be the most slept on coach right now because i think the scheme he's gonna provide as organization to a young team which they've been lacking for multiple years now you have Lamelo ball back they had trey man who who to me showed a lot of good signs beforehand as their backup yeah and then Brandon Miller, who had a phenomenal rookie year. I just feel like even those teams, which people are thinking are going to be at the bottom, can beat you on any given night, for yeah, sure. it's going to be comp. It's going to be comp. And I, I'm cheering for the Hornets and Charles Lee, because Charles Lee comes from the Mike Budenholzer coaching tree Yes, as well. He had time here in Milwaukee, and he was very, very highly regarded here in Milwaukee as well. I had the same love for him like I had when Ham went to the Lakers. I was just like... It's a tough situation to walk into for a first-time <laughs> head coach, Ham. But I'm hoping for the best. Now, Ham's back in Milwaukee. He's back, He's back though. Yeah. He's back in Milwaukee. I mean, his son was playing for UWM, uh, University of Milwaukee, uh, here oh, as well. Okay. So, um, you, you know, city ties. And then also Charles Lee uh, going over there to Charlotte. I just really like that move for him. It's a great situation, I think, for a first-time head coach as well, where it's yes. not that much pressure. You get to build your system and get everything the way that you want to run it. So I'm excited to see what the Hornets do. It's actually one of my most excited, like anticipated games this upcoming year is when the they're Hornets on my league pass for sure this year. Yep. Milwaukee. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, the Eastern conference is a dog fight. I think for the bucks, th- this, this is, uh, this is a make or break year in terms of the Dame Giannis continuity. I think they showed a lot of signs last year. They had a lot of games where Dame and Giannis could both have, 
30 point games and make their impact known in the game at the same time i'm a big proponent of a duo working off of each other so i want to see more inverted pick and rolls more dho like just more actions that include dame and Giannis, even if Giannis is being used off the ball in spots because i will always tell people this remember the bucks won a title the minute they had Chris Middleton closing out the game with Giannis off the ball as a screener, it was easily one of the most devastating actions for the time in the league, in the playoffs, where Chris Middleton found his comfort spots in that mid-range area and Giannis was finishing with ease in transition. That is the answer, right? Making the roles easier where Giannis, if he gets the board, go. If Dame swings it, transition trailer three. And then also again like the reason why i'm so high on on uh trent is because they finally have a legitimate movement shooter who can run off the ball yeah. who can create easy dunk opportunities for Giannis if he's in the action it just adds more versatility way more to me it has so much more i see someone in the comment dropped in the that the dame bobby pick and roll was better than the dame and Giannis one and that's not a surprise at all <laughs> oh, uh, yeah at that point to me and i'm sure that the dame brooke would also be higher than the dame Giannis one but the thing too with the screening as you mentioned like chris middleton and Giannis and their chemistry i mean they've been playing together since 2013. the chemistry that chris and Giannis has is different because they've been able to go through that fire together a lot and the way that Giannis even set screens for chris is far different than the way that dame wants screens set for him so there's Agreed. all that finding the chemistry of like what angle do you want this screen at when do you want me to release okay when i do this oh, how should i attack it um, and exactly. Giannis and Dame have been trying to figure that out. Like, I wish it was sometimes, but like the real NBA is not like 2K where you can make a trade and everything just clicks immediately right after because you're in control. Real life, it takes time to build that chemistry between players, understanding angles, understanding when to get the ball out, understanding when you're looking for the ball. I mean, also establishing the communication to be able to say, like, bro, you missed me or I need this here. Like, give me the ball right now and figuring all that out. So. For the exactly. Bucks, a lot of different options for them. Um, but I think that training camp is going to be so good for this group to have. In addition to that, they spent the offseason also putting in work, installing things already. So uh, I think that the chemistry and the synergy on the Bucks is going to be a lot better going into this season. Especially with Dame and um, like Dame being able to just repair and heal. And then Giannis staying active overseas, not getting hurt, and being able to come back. I think both of these players are going to start their seasons in better shape than last year, which is saying something. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Especially for Dame, which really shifts the entire dynamic. But, yeah, th those are your 2025 uh, Bucks talks. I think we really highlighted as many parts as we could. First off, great conversation, Camille. You were a joy to have uh, on this pod. But before we end, I want to transition – to something else okay. i'm a gamer yes sir you're a gamer i am 2k25 is coming out now you don't know my takes on 25 or my history on 25 i'm walking through this real quick right on this basketball podcast um 2k is like the bane of my existence <laughs> right because every year and i'm not sure how long i've been playing i've been playing since maybe 16 right Every year, for the most part, except for 18, because 18, which is God awful all the way through and through. It don't matter. Most of the time for me, the first week of the game is the best UK I've ever played. Year after year after year. And then when Mike Wayne does the little patch stuff he does, we're now, okay, my jump shot looking way different. Hold on. I was greening the other day <laughs> in the rec center. Now I can't find it it really like changes up. And then now with the new 2K, I've kind of been a prisoner because as the content creator who really focuses basketball, I was going to be done. But then when they said, oh, if you spend $150 on a game, you get leap as it's like, ah, they I'm got a me content like creator. Like, yeah, they got me two years off that. I'm like, you know, cool. But thankfully on this um, platform here, I have the power to watch NBA games with people on playback for me, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, League Pass isn't the same draw to get 2K as it was in prior years. Me personally, I'm going to tell you my take, and you can let me know if you agree or okay. disagree. I am done with 2K for now because 
I am tired of acknowledging that this franchise is still releasing this game on dirty, dusty PlayStation 4s and broken down Xbox Ones. And I say this because they cannot push the game to the peak of its powers until we let them go. Mm. See, I don't know about that. So I am I think I might be about 10 years older than you, somewhere in that, okay. in that range, right? I've been playing 2K since the Shaq cover, which I think was 2K6. Or oh, yeah, you've been locked in. Okay, so word. Been, I, I was a live, I was an NBA live player, and then I transitioned mm. to 2K. Uh, and then once you start being able to go online and play. So I have consistently played 2K since like 2005. And I've been okay. online with 2K since they've started the 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 wreck and the pro am and all that stuff, which I think was 16 or 17, somewhere in that right. room. Um, and one, it's Monopoly, right? If you want to play a basketball game, 2K is your only option. Um, so it's all you got. It's all you got. So every year, my mentality going into it is I'm gonna make the best of it the way that I can. And I don't play a meta style of 2K. So when people complain about things getting patched, I'm never like, oh, well, like they got me because I'm never making builds based on, you know, you never make your build off of the best build style build. with the cheese build. animation and all that. No, I already you mentioned I'm a, I'm a mid range player. I'm a mid, I'm a, I'm an all around player, but my focus and scoring is in the mid range and I got high okay. passing. I'm a two way, like all around type of build. So like that's hard to Word. generally patch. And also, when I'm, like I mentioned, I'm I'm, old. I'm in my mid 30s now, so it's one of those things where 2K is something that keeps me and my friends together. Where it's like, who's hooping Absolutely. tonight? Absolutely. And now at this point in, in life, you got people all around the country living in all different kind of places, and 2K is a time to like just kick all it. All come together. Yeah. yeah. So and like, I right. always have love for 2K for that reason and what that game means for like me and my friends. Um, but I do objectively think that. 25 is going to be good because of that pro play edition, how they added that in 24. I really like okay. NBA 2K24. I was cooking. I didn't have a problem with it. It just, it just, it just the one thing that irked me. Cause again, I like playing the game, right? Like I, I'm always the last person in my friend group to be playing 2K. Cause ever since 2K20, when they instituted the feature where you could see each other green shots or not, yeah. I'm like, I gotta be cold like that now. Cause now they can see. So like I'm like I gotta actually learn how to shoot with the meter off like I was locking in right, but in 24 the one one issue I had is the badge regression system was just ah because it's like some badges were hard to get period and then when you finally got it it's like oh well you played a rec game and they didn't pass you the ball the whole game so you couldn't get the badge stuff so because of that West. gold drops to silver and it's like damn. <laughs> And then too, some games don't require you to do everything that you normally do. Like I'm a great post player, but every game not going to be in the post because it's not required True. every time. So yeah. I do love they took away regression in 25, and now it's like whatever you love earn, what you earn, and you you keep it. Yeah, I'll probably tune into this 2K after this year is over. But I'm just saying in terms of like my day one days, mainly because like I don't really have a squad of friends who consistently are on 2K because every year we've tried it, I have yeah. to carry. <laughs> they get mad, pissed off at the game. They don't really play the game. They just say, I'm going to spend my $100. I'm, I'm going to get my build up. And we just going to make it rock. I'm like, but you got to actually play to you be do. good. Like, I'm, Hey, man, if you change your mind and you like, I want to hoop, just hit me up. My my at, my, oh, my word, okay. I'm on PSN. My ad is the same as my Twitter and all my handles. Say that. Neil Monet on the PSN. So I'll definitely hoop with you if you need someone to hoop with. See, look, this this is a lit podcast. <laughs> Finding someone that knows basketball in both ways, because people people have oh, to yeah. understand. <laughs> people be playing 2K not knowing basketball. And, and <laughs> I'm sorry. As someone that like religiously in 2K20 would boot up the wreck with like a 6-1 pure shooter. I was mm -hmm. averaging like 38. Every time I would queue up in the wreck, the amount of times where I'm wide open at the hash or waiting for the pass and they run by you and run out of bounds or take a, a, a bad shot, like it weighs on you. I feel like if I had a friend group that was consistently in it with me, I'd be there. But because I'm not and there's other games like I still have to be Elder Ring all the way through. I'm playing through that right now. The DLC is crazy. Um, there, There's also Black Myth Wukong. There's 
crazier games on the way as well those are going to probably occupy my side for the most part shit just i think two days ago concord job i've been on that that's been pretty fun too so i'm taking my time but i i really feel like for 2k to maximize themselves they got to stop being lazy with some of their changes and i just feel like last bro it's 2024 yeah. if you don't have a next gen console at this point give it up it's we okay to stop calling it next gen it's really current gen and it's current gen I, yes 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 i like <laughs> the 2k community has has always been in the mindset where they just say it's next gen no this is current now. gen we gotta move out that stigma i that's agree fact. that's what bothers me i'm like it's it's this is now the current y'all y'all in the old gen yeah well for those of you who made it this far into the podcast this is the very first podcast out of 58 other episodes where i've mentioned 2k we talked about it in depth and we actually might be hooping after this so that's dope uh big shout out to camille great great podcast episode how did you enjoy your time today man i will come back anytime you ask me to come back i really enjoyed our Liddy. conversation i'm thankful for it. it's always nice to just talk hoops with somebody who knows what they're talking about and just have a fun conversation the chat was cool everything about this was fun so i would definitely come back anytime much appreciated it like i've been doing this podcast for like two years now um i have most of my experience in talking basketball from twitter spaces where you just queue it up and you talk mm -hmm. about everything you know happening this podcast is meant to be a extension of me covering the nba beyond my regular uh you know videos i watch a ton of basketball and i know it feels weird sometimes to get random dms saying hey what's up my name is this like but like i try to reach out as much as possible because to me that's how you build yeah. community and find some you know cool people and i feel like we both know what we're talking about what is the biggest thing it's okay to admit that there's some things you don't know a whole lot about that's why i am taking the challenge of doing this podcast on all 30 teams every off season with someone who covers the team or is close to it so i can educate myself on okay what is their ins and outs what are their expectations and you did a great job great job at that for sure today so everyone in the comments who made it this far spam up w's for camille um go tap into her links I'll, I'll make sure to put those in the description box below Camille, are there any closing words you have for episode 59 of the gift of who's podcast i got i got one because i see nico in the comments i'm not trying to leave you hanging nico he wanted to know that i want anyone selected in that spot that aj johnson was selected i was oh, okay. shocked that the bugs made that pick at <laughs> i was 23. Too. I was like, wait, what? And I honestly think had they went Tyler Smith 23 and then AJ Johnson at 33, everybody would have been like, okay, cool. Like it made this makes sense. Um, but after seeing AJ Johnson in the summer league, I get what the Bucks are doing, leaning into a developmental role. Initially, I thought maybe they would trade one of those draft picks and get more veteran help initially. Uh, but now right. I get it. They're really leaning in and try to have that development on the roster as well. So I'm cool with the AJ Johnson pick at this point. I'm looking forward to see what he develops into. Dope. Yeah, we'll definitely see how that uh, pans out. But Camille, I appreciate you. Great podcast. I'll be hitting you up when the clips and all that for this pod are uh, about to drop. The grind never stops. Good luck on the Locked on Buck stuff. I'll be tapped in all the time. So appreciate have you. a good one. You too, man. And hit me up when you get 2K. I got you. I will definitely hit you. But uh, peace out, people. Y'all have a good one. This has been episode 59 of the Get The Hoops podcast. You can find this podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts at Get The Hoops. And it's on the YouTube at Get The Hoops. So peace out, people. And cut. Okay, perfect. Great pod. Um, that was that, fun, man. That was a great conversation. <laughs> that was very fun. I, I was not expecting to spend time on 2K because... <laughs> It's been the bane of my existence for some time because of things that have nothing really to do with me like that. But I'll definitely hit you up. Um, I'm probably going to redownload 24. I think this year what my plan is going to be, I'm mm -hmm. going to try to get the most out of 24. And then when like December or, or January pops out, yeah. I'll then check out 25. I'm you curious. Oh, the, the game can still be good. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I feel it. Yeah. Just whenever it is, just hit me up. I'll be on. Look. It, it, it dropped Wednesday morning at 7 a.m. I will be on the game at 6.55 a.m. Oh, you locked in for real, for real. Okay. Like, listen, That's hard. Play, my friend, we take off for work. We be we be ready <laughs> for the 2K day. It's a holiday. I'll never, one story and I'll let you go. It was sure. one year I was at work and I didn't know my friends was taking, they was all off work. And I see the group chat just going like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at home. Oh, I'm at home too. Oh, I am too. Let's get on 2K. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? I'm at work like a sucker and y'all all at home playing the game. Like I, I'd be tight. 
I would be tight. After that day, I said never again will I be at work when 2K drops off. So we are gonna be work. in sync in sync on that one day. I feel you on that for sure. My friend group's a bit different because I play the game the most. Mm-hmm. Um, they get irritated with the game very, very quickly. And they don't want to adapt to the changes. They just want everything to be given to them. Like they spend mm-hmm. like a hundred, <laughs> they spend a hundred and fifty dollars on a game, VC, all that. I don't even buy VC. I just played in my career, grind it up. I learn my shot. I, I pop out, and they just drop the game. It's like, well, damn. Now I'm shit out of luck. No, I'm ready. I ain't, <laughs> I ain't got no homie. So I go in, in, into the wreck. In game chat, and it'd be the worst experience that you can ever oh, have. Listen, especially when I go in as a woman, I be they be they be cooking me. I was like, oh, you know I know they they be going crazy for no reason. I yeah, was like, you know what? I just turned I turned my messages off. I turned all that off. I was like, Mm-mm. no, I respect it. I respect because they be getting toxic. That that two gay community can definitely get toxic, toxic. with you. So yeah, but yeah, I mean, yeah Camille, I you, man. Yes, I appreciate you so much. Um, I have more podcasts coming. This episode 59, I think the next pod that's going to drop probably Saturday is probably episode 56. So this should come out in two weeks. I'll uh, edit this and ping you with the clips on Twitter and all that. But very much appreciated. Let's keep in touch. This won't just be like a one podcast thing. During the season, I'm going to definitely extend these out. Um, Here on Playback, this is a platform where it allows you to actually watch the games live as they're on. As a creator, I can give you access to actually be able to watch these games. So if you ever want to watch a Bucks game or whatever sometime, you can come in. I'll be planning content for the entire regular season on here for sure. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, we can definitely try to link that up because I'm sure we cool. don't do locked on Bucks on the weekends. So if the Bucks play okay. on Friday or Saturday, uh, I don't have any like content to create then. So like those would be great games to try to link up for as, lo- as sure. a watch. Better up. Cool. I'll wait you up. But have a good one. It's been a great day. Sure. I'm going to go shower and take care of some adult responsibilities now. But... I'm going to I'm gonna go make this dinner before my husband get home and then shower and get That's the wave. content creation because it's time. NBA season starts very, very soon. But yeah. good luck. Have a good one. Thanks. You too. Take care. Yep. Peace out, people.